So in my professional life, I'm an urban planner, but more recently, um, the creator behind a YouTube channel called City Nerd. And yeah, City Nerd is all about cities and transportation. And often these days, the videos are centered on something happening in the Las Vegas area. Now, that's where I'm living right now. And like a lot of people, I'm not actually from Las Vegas. I'm, I came here from Portland, Oregon in January of this year, which leads to a lot of questions. Like, why would you move from Portland, which is purportedly this progressive bastion of sustainability and good planning, and move to Las Vegas, which is thought to be kind of the opposite of all of those things. And, you know, most often that question comes in the form of, how can you call yourself an urbanist and live there? Which, I don't know, that just kind of rubs me the wrong way, as if to be a true urbanist, you have to live in some expensive neighborhood in some expensive coastal city, a very small number of coastal cities. So that's what today's talk is all about. It's can you be an urbanist and live in, say, a Sunbelt city? And my answer to that is not only yes, but I think it's actually crucial to be able to understand the values of urbanism. You really have to try to live it in a place that has potential, but is often actually kind of forthrightly hostile to urbanism. Now, before we get too far into this, I do want to talk a little bit about what urbanism even is. And so this is from one of my videos where I tried to define it. And for me, it is the belief that dense walkable cities are kind of an optimal form for supporting things like sustainability and efficiency and progress on climate. Now, the way you could look at that is it's a lot more efficient to try to serve 10,000 homes in a dense urban area than it is to try to serve you know, sewer lines to 10,000 homes way out in the suburbs. It just kind of makes intuitive sense, right? Now, you can, you can understand why someone who thinks that way might prefer to live in a place like Boston or San Francisco or Portland. And, you know, to be honest, Living car-free or car-light has been my way of life for the last 10, 15 years. And the thing is, a, a place like Portland makes that pretty straightforward with the land use and the way the, way the transportation system is set up. Um, not necessarily that way in Las Vegas. The difference now is that I have this larger platform you know, this YouTube channel, and I recognize that a lot of the people who watch my channel do live in places where it's a lot more challenging to try to live car-free. And I just don't feel like I can talk to those people with a straight face unless I myself have attempted to live a car-free or car-light life in a place that is often hostile to it. And so what this talk is going to be is really the perspective of someone who's used to living car-free in a place like Portland, except now I'm doing it in Southern Nevada. And you may already be questioning my sanity for even trying, even trying to live here without a car. I kind of question it myself sometimes, but you know, just think of it this way. When you've built up habits over 10 or 20 years of living car-free, it's really hard to let them go. And it just becomes really ingrained in what you do every day. It becomes a structure that you build your life around. So the other thing, though, is, you know, once you've been living without a car in your personal budget, that's hard to let go of, too. So the cost of car ownership. Now, this is a national number. It's very general. It's very average. But the average household in the United States spends something like $11,000 a year on transportation. And that is almost all car, right? And so that may seem like a big number to you, maybe bigger than you were thinking. But the thing is, the only time that you really get a price signal, and by that, what I mean is when you really feel the pain in your wallet, is really when you fill up at the gas pump. So that $11,000 number includes things like depreciation, maintenance, insurance. 
The other thing is, you know, there are more reasons to not own a car than just your personal finances. There are more altruistic reasons and things that are really maybe more important. CO2 emissions, pollution, traffic safety, and we call these the externalities of driving. And the thing is, all of these things tend to move in the right direction when we reduce our vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. Now, I mentioned I'm a planner by trade, so I'm gonna go back to grad school really quickly and talk about the most impactful thing I learned in an entire two years of graduate studies and planning. It happened in a course where we were presented with a data set from a regional household travel survey, which every metropolitan region does this. They send out a, a set of, they send out travel diaries to a select group of people living in the region to try to find a representative group to show how people travel, you know, what time do people travel, what mode do they use, what are their origins and destinations. And this is all important information that gets fed back to the Metropolitan Authority so that they can model future behavior and decide on future investments. So in our assignment, we got this data set and we were asked to look at all the different independent variables it provided and it's got a lot of sexy stuff in it that pl planning students would normally think, oh yeah, that would have an impact on VMT. It had built environment, it's got density, it's got you know, how many travel options there are. But do you know what the actual most important thing out of all the independent variables was? And it wasn't even close. It's just vehicle ownership. Do you own a car? Okay, that bears repeating. The single biggest determinant by far of how much you drive is just do you own a car or not? So this is kind of obvious if you think about it. If you have a car, you drive, right? Because the thing is, a car is a sunk cost. Once you bought it, kind of the marginal cost of each additional trip, at least the way you perceive it is, it, it almost feels like nothing. So the end result is you drive a lot. Now, let's look at how this plays out in the Las Vegas region. If you get by without a car, and that's me right now, you are one of about three to 4% of people in the region. If you get by with just one car, you're still, that's still less than a quarter of the people in the region. So that's where we're at. Now, what I'm not advocating for here is never ever use a personal vehicle ever again. I mean, I actually took an Uber here. I will rent a car sometimes if it makes sense. But what I would say is if you just start by not owning a car, it allows the price signals to do their work, right? And so you make more creative, more, more, uh, more cost-effective workarounds. Now, what you might say is, well, that sounds theoretically possible, but also very, very limiting. And so my thought about that is, let's talk about right-sizing our personal radius. That's what I call it, our personal radius. Instead of having a car and assuming that you have to drive kind of all over the city every day to take care of basic daily tasks, shopping, dining, work, you instead travel in a more localized area. You get to know the shops and the restaurants and you know, the other daily needs within like a two to three mile radius. You might still take transit or an Uber somewhere. So that's a different way to think about your personal radius. In a way, what I'm talking about here is a little bit like going to a rehab clinic or like going to a writer's retreat where you shut off all the outside distractions and you just focus on the core important things. So what I'm talking about here is constraints. And I know the word constraints could have a negative connotation, but I'm talking about self-imposed constraints. And I believe that setting your own limitations is paradoxically incredibly liberating. You tend to come up with more creative solutions. You, uh, you, know, you find more inspiration. And that can be a very powerful experience. In fact, if 
I, I feel that if I hadn't gone down this path of going car free, I wouldn't really have the mental bandwidth to summon the motivation or the creativity to put out a completely ridiculous video every week. Okay, I know that what I'm espousing here goes directly against this country's extreme veneration for the concept of having it all. And just my thought on that is having it all is pretty overrated. Like, all is a lot to manage. And so what I would submit to you is that if you just focused on having a manageable sum, you might be happier. Now, I realize this is America. We put a really high premium on ownership. Like, home ownership is a pretty good deal. But car ownership, car ownership is ownership of a depreciating asset. And I kind of liken it to, I don't know, kind of a learned helplessness, right? Do you feel more free when you are driving a car around? Or does it kind of do the opposite? It's really a matter of perspective. Do you feel more, do you feel more free driving around the region in a climate controlled metal box? Or do you feel more free if you have a little bit more freedom of thought, a little bit more peace in your mind, and maybe 11,000 extra dollars in your pocket? So I do want to talk about the practicalities of how I moved to Vegas and how I, how I decided to try to live car free here because you know, I do like Vegas, but also I knew it was going to give me a chance to sort of walk the walk and try to live car free somewhere where it's just not that easy. But I was a little concerned about it. Well, when I got to Vegas, what I quickly realized was the place is set up pretty well for biking. It's pretty flat and it has a lot of features that lend themselves well to a bike network. So. This is looking at the city of Henderson, which is where I landed. But you've got power line trails, you've got wash trails, you've got rail trails, and you've got freeway trails. And it's not a perfect setup, but I can get a lot of places in 15 to 20 minutes just by bike. I did have one kind of non-negotiable criterion when I was deciding where to live, and that was I really wanted to be located near a particular Polynesian-themed grocery retailer. And I did manage to achieve that, but it's a little different here. You know, any city you go to, this place, the, the, the people who are at the check stand are always very chatty. But here, when they got done bagging my groceries, you know what they said? And this just blew me away because this didn't happen anywhere else I lived. What they said is, drive safely. And that kind of took me aback the first couple of times. And I was like, oh, no, I'm good. I rode my bike here. But then they kind of look at you like you're certifiable. And so I just stopped doing that. <laughs> I want to give you kind of like my daily challenges and successes and failures trying to live car free here. Bike parking, it kind of doesn't exist anywhere. Maybe a few places. But generally, anywhere I go, I assume I have to lock up to the nearest fixed object of whatever, whatever kind. And that could be you know, usually a signpost. And that's, that's about as good as I can do. Uh, street design. Street design. I've talked about this in a couple of videos. It is nuts here. It is nuts. So this is a curb tight sidewalk and a curb type bike lane running next to traffic that is signed for 45 miles per hour. I'm not gonna use that bike lane. And then heat, you know, before I moved here, somebody should have told me it gets hot. <laughs> you know, July and August were pretty brutal, but listen, December and January in Portland, are really terrible for biking too. So for me, it's a little bit of a wash. I would say to be fair, about nine months of the year here are actually pretty good for biking. And you know what, I'm even game for the other three months. You know, it's kind of a dry heat, right? That's what I'd say. But the problem is it's, it's a dry heat that kind of wicks the moisture off your skin faster than your body can produce it. And then before you know it, you're biking down the Pittman Wash Trail, like hallucinating. That is not ideal, so bring water. Transit, I am not a fan of the RTC bus stops. Like, I don't even know where you stand at most of these bus stops, there's no room for it. But I am a fan of the vehicles. 
I find that the RTC vehicles are relatively new and clean. They tend to be spacious. They don't run quite as, frequent as I, frequently as I'd like, but I have always been a bus person. I find buses to be extremely democratic. They're there for everybody. You know, you might say, well, the bus takes longer because of all the stops. And my thought is, yeah, it takes longer, but you know what, I can read on the bus. I can get out my phone and be responding to absurd viewer comments from one of my latest videos on the bus, which I do. So for me, for me, the, the, the transit could be better, but it works fine for what I need. So look, I realize that what I'm talking about here isn't gonna be for everyone, all right? People work cross town, people work swing shifts, people have kids, they have to get to school safely. And not everyone can choose to, or maybe afford to live in a walkable, bikeable area. But I think more people can probably do that than the three or 4% who currently do. So again, it's all about perspective. Does driving make you feel more free or less? Does it make you feel like you're being consistent with the way you want to live your life or like the planet you want to leave to future generations or not? And maybe the most important thing, how much do you care about what other people think? And in particular, what's your tolerance for awkward interactions with the checker at Trader Joe's? Before I get out of here, I do want to point out that there are always good planning efforts in the Vegas area that can help promote car-free and car-light living, so I do encourage you to get involved. But I would also say, if you're waiting for things to be perfect before you try to reduce your car dependency, there's a good chance it's just never going to happen. In other words, if you're waiting for Las Vegas to become Amsterdam, well, that's a tall order. And besides, Vegas is already pretty busy being Venice, New York, and Paris. And that's all I got. Thank you.